Cheers. Pleasure. Mate, cheers for fastball. Mm. Um, no drama. I'm going to give, we'll give Gaz Sunita's Guild a quick shout for the introduction. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one of the weird things, huh? Yeah, so mate. Um, so, Australian Defence Force, one hour. Yeah. Got out. Yeah. Went to security. Yeah. Afghan. Iraq for a long time, from pretty much when it first really got, was really interesting, like early, early days. Um, so I got over there in 2004 for that, and it was good. Um, it's not, I don't think it's ever going to be that good again, money-wise and work-wise. I mean, there's so many jobs around, it was, it was good fun, different jobs. And uh, yeah, after that, I just got jack of it, and, and like, I don't know if you spent much time in Iraq, but um, sort of that 2007, towards the end of 2007, it was getting pretty mad. So, um, yeah, it was, everyone was getting a bit, I just wanted something different. Can you carry a bit closer? Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah, well, mate, you got it different. You ended up in fucking prison for seven Yeah, well, I, I went out, I went, I, I sort of was kicking around here for a, a couple of years and then I was just started looking for a bit of work. And um, I wanted to go to Afghan, just for something different. And I hooked up with this bunch over there who were a bit loose, to say, to put it mildly. Yeah, it was sort of one of the start. It was sort of around the time they really started pushing local companies to be, or everyone was sort of local, but you know what I mean. Um, really pushing it. And this company I went to work for was mixed up with the host nation trucking, which is one of the biggest fucking rorts ever so basically what they were doing was instead of using their u.s military's logistics system they were using a mixture of boats to pakistan and then trucks everywhere in afghanistan yeah and so you can imagine the amount of shit that ended up in the black market um basically the deal was was to put a bit of the, the money back into the local economy so they took it's basically how it worked a load turns up in Pakistan, by ship, connex of whatever, Humvee parts, gets trucked on the back of a truck, goes up to the border, gets transferred to another truck, and he gets to dock it of the local driver. Then he drives it to where it has to go, usually to Bagram first, and then from there. But they also did ones where they flew into Bagram, got loaded there, mainly the mail, and then it got taken out to all the various fobs for the Yanks. So they get their dock it, they drop their load off, it, cool, it sits in the cooling yard for 24 hours so it doesn't go bang. And then he gets his load, hands it in, gives them the docket, they give him money. That's how it's supposed to work in theory. Didn't quite work like that all the time. Um, and basically, a bunch of security companies started getting started up, um, basically to run, to protect these guys. And the majority of them were locals now there was a there was one bunch over there running around over there and they were, they were using all afghanis and they, and they were um they were actually doing the stuff for the mod for the british military do the same sort of thing but they, they got they they were using gurkhas to to basically run the the um crews on the ground it was as bad um <laughs> it was there was one bunch they, they one type convoy 100 trucks over 100 trucks and I come through the next day and there was just burnout wrecks everywhere. I counted probably 30 odd before I just stopped and I was still in the process of recovery. And funnily enough, the, um, in the Russian-Afghan war, they ambushed a, a Russian convoy and in the same spot, exact same spot and obliterated them. So this is probably the kids, of the guys who did the original mm. bit. And that's how, how it works over there. I mean, I've got this weird relationship with Afghanistan. I still miss the places. Nuts. Um, but, you know, after that, after seeing that one, I was sort of open my eyes a bit and I'm going, okay, i to change the way we're doing things. But anyway, so I'm working for this company and it was a mixture of people. There was a lot of Macedonians there which, who were shit. Um, there was, when I got there, there was a bunch of pretenders. There was guys, there was a guy there who was American, black American guy who was a sniper in the Marines in the British Army. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and then, and then we had another... How many guy, up? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and, then he, and then you 
sort of be picking him and, he, and he'd be tripping over himself. Um, there was another guy that they hired. I met him when he was working for another company, but then they hired him and I just said, yeah, nah, because this, this dude, he was British as well, and he reckoned he'd been with 3-2 Battalion in the, um, in the South African Defence Force. And uh, if he'd done that, he would have been about three. <laughs> he couldn't speak any Afrikaans or Portuguese, which 3-2 guys all did. Um, yeah, they did. there was actually no Englishman there. There were hardly any Englishmen there. They were all Afrikaans or whites in that, that particular unit. So, you know, there, there was that, that happened, and, and that, that is my thing with the security industry. There is a, a lot of pretenders out there. I, 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 I'm not SF. I, I've never done that much, I don't think. Um, ex recon guy, that's about it. And yeah, but these other people out there think they need to bolster their CV a bit to get a job. I don't know. It's really oh, it's weird. cutthroat industry, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, you got it. Mm. What, what kind of year are we talking? No, this was uh, this is all around 2008 okay. because Iraq, you know, after Iraq, it was so the first, the first couple of years were good because there was not much going on. Like, we had to have a card, we have a weapons cards and stuff, that's okay. But we had all the toys, especially the crew I was working for, had everything. And um, you could sort of get away with doing a few things as long as you didn't, you weren't too obtuse. <laughs> you could, you could um, have some fun. But um, yeah, Afghanistan, the Wild West, mate. It was just mm. nuts. It was absolutely nuts. And then you just drive around town, there was no green zone, there was none of that. Was just, how, how more people didn't get smacked into in, in Kabul back then. Is beyond me. It's um... it's the it, yeah. We had the same. I mean, when I did private security, I worked in Iraq. I did four mm. years in there. I was in like Ramallah area, Bakshi. Mm. But the same problem started happening there, where cost cut in. Well, different reasons. Cost cut in. You yeah. ended up with uh, less than quality people on the contract at, on occasion, and some you get some bluffers. But then also that problem of bringing in the local nationals. Man. Yeah. You know, we, um, but unfortunately, you got to do it. That's the thing. Yeah. To a degree, especially if working. There was, right? You got to bring in. You got to bring in the locals sometimes. And oh yeah, absolutely. But it's it's. Man, when you when you're cutting about with six or seven, of, you know, in a, in a team of, I don't know, seven or eight of you, and there's only one expat. Yeah. You know no. what I mean? Well, you're gonna lock my next will be again. So we get to Afghanistan, and the boss of the company, the owner of the company, was ex SF sergeant, American guy, Green Bray, uh, weapons sergeant. So he's all about cars and guns. He yeah. was also, he'd also been smashed up pretty badly during over there, but one of his trips over there. So, and the two I see the company or one of the VPs, every, everyone was a VP, it was sort of fucking annoying because you couldn't get much done. You know, everyone wanted their little fight and they wanted to just work. You know. um, I worked with a couple of these guys and, and I just said, there's no fucking way no one I'm going out the road and they're going to get me fucking killed. I'd rather work by myself. And, um, they put me up with a pretty good driver, Slant Turbo, the Cesaro dude. Oh, I, that was the one guy I worked with the entire time after that. And um, eventually, after a few misses, we come across this bunch of guys, these Pashtun dudes. Uh, they're basically, they're, they're probably ripping our shit off at one pump, pump point. But they were working for a, um, we did a, a run. It was actually when they were building Bastion. And we were running stuff over there. And was this was in the 2008 when no one was moving through um, through the provinces because it was just too fucking hot. So, uh, so there must be expanding bus in there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we 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 were trying to get this stuff over there. We, 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 the convoy was actually was over a hundred trucks, and and some of them were going to a marine fog they were putting out in the middle of the red desert. And the rest of them we were dropping off in Bastion on the way. So we we're sort of heading out that way. We went through Helmand or so. Very entertaining trip. Um, when we got down to um, sort of south of Garzini, we were just getting smacked. And it was literally out for three days. We just got hit. It was like Mad Max. It was fucking nuts. Lost. I think we ended up losing about 12, 12 security guys. I can't remember how many drivers and shit. But um, yeah, it was just, we are running an ammo. We basically had to go fucking raid. The, the cops would be all hiding in there. Fuck off. So we just go in there and take their fucking ammo off, off again. It was that bad, and we eventually got over there and got it all sorted out. And this one point, when we're on the way back, we come across these guys who are looking after this um, camp of road construction guys. And they're all Pashtun, and one of them knew the boss from when the, the war first started. 
when you first went in. Well, use uh, tenth group sales. Well, actually, not that early. Would have been probably two thousand three or four when he went. So, anyway, so this young guy knows him, and he ends up working for me. And so I had this crew, of, and they worked directly for me. I paid them um, through the company, of course, but I, I paid them myself because I, I figured that would increase my longevity on the road. They were, you know, and I led by example, which is something that most people don't actually get. They didn't have body armor, so I didn't wear body armor. I dressed like them sometimes, would depend on what we're doing. I did, I did, I used to do it all the time, then I got shot at too many times like the Americans. So, you know, if I was working anywhere near the Yanks, I'd carry an M4 and dress like I was one of them. But if I was uh, out on my own with the, do- the dudes, it was okay, and long shirt and shit, so. Um, yeah, and I drive back by myself. I've, I've done the Kandahar run, just me and my driver at night. You don't get shot. You know, we've hit a few roadblocks that way, and it always gets a bit interesting. But yeah, that's all right. And uh, yeah, but I did that for a year, and I was getting a bit being going out for on your own like that for a couple of weeks at a time. <laughs> you get a bit, you get a bit uh, antsy. So yeah, towards the end, it was getting a bit rough. And uh, we had a, there was another bunch of dudes who worked for the company. Well, they, according to them, they ran the company. One of them was a warlord who was uh, married to Sharma Sood's sister. So the Panchiri dude. And everyone has this opinion of the Panchiris are the saviors of Afghanistan against the Russians. Blah, fucking blah. They're just a bunch of drug dealer warlords like the rest of them. They're, They're no different. If anything, they saw an opening, and if you talk to any older Russian guys you come across them, they, they'll tell you they, they pretty much had a deal with them so they could run opium out of the place through Kazakhstan because Panchir, the Panchir is in the north and all that. So what these guys were doing, because they worked out, because essentially these convoys are under military protection, you can't touch them, and you, especially when the Yanks are their mail. If they got mail, you, you just shoot people because it's the mail and if they look like they're going to steal the mail can't steal the mail so it's United Postal Service so you, <laughs> they're more worried about the mail than they were the fuel and the ammunition you know it's mm. fucking bizarre but that's the Yanks work um, what they used to do is a convoy would rock out say 10 trucks and it'd get shot at pretty early like just when you get out, get out of town out of the city limits or something they get shot at and they'd go to the whatever expats for them because they had some dudes that were all right they had other ones that weren't it was they had no guys that had no fucking business being over there there's some guy who was redneck from fucking one of the southern states who was like a, a reserve sheriff or some shit and why are you running convoys and he, he, he's doing shit like muzzling fucking the locals and smashing their radios when they're playing their music in the cars they're driving and it's not really how you win hearts and minds. It just doesn't work like that. You've never really done much outside of wherever he was from. But anyway, so they get shot up, and the the big brave Afghan security guys go, "It's not safe. You need to go back. Well, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it." And so he'd go back, and then what they'd do is add their trucks to the convoy, and now no one can touch them. Police can't search them. Military can't search and and they can take whatever they want to wherever they want because it's essentially under military protection. Yeah. So what they were doing this this warlord, yeah, he had a mate who was in the NDS, the secret police, which are essentially all Panchiri anyway. Um, who was uh, the duty signed off on all the weapons in in the UN um, uh, destruction thing that the plant had set up in um, Jalalabad. So all these weapons are captured, they go up there, get destroyed. He signs off on them, they don't get destroyed, they just come back out again. They run them down south, swap them with the opium farmers for drugs. They come back up, using that. Plus all the normal shit of steel and stuff, steel and fucking fuel. They used to weld um, troughs in the back of the, the fuel tankers. So, and the Yanks couldn't work it out. They, <laughs> like, every, every fuel thing, no matter what we do, we put seals on, every, we lose 10%. And um, my driver took me to where they welded up the fuel tankers. And they weld, welded it on sections, but they put a trough in the bottom. So you drain, you can drain that thing bone dry. But in the, in the bottom of it, there's this little sump. Clicks, 
that's the Afghan tax or <laughs> oh, we can't that's how we, we take 10% it's just how it is so you know little scams like that and um, yeah so I used to I was being a, a little bit OCD like most guys who have been in support company too long now um, I'd count on my trucks what's this that's for the, for the US military I'm pretty sure they don't need firewood why is there a truck load of firewood here why oh, you know and you pick it up and there'd be something under it either guns or drugs or whatever so get rid of it they try and yeah. smuggle that through with the, yeah. with the military convoy yeah. Yeah. and um, yeah and they just couldn't really do much about me and I, and I sort of put a bit of my, and my guys only answered to me so yeah that worked really well and the patch tune usually you gotta if with the patch tune dudes that I found out this is much later um, majority of the Taliban and patch tune so they tend someone knows somebody's cousin brother and they can sort of know what's going on on the road which is okay what are we doing are we i want to be moving now is it okay to move down there mm, maybe give it a day all right so it's your pick. and they get they hit big they hit the yanks or whatever and then we go down the next day because they run out of ammo but you know it, it's that sort of that sort of element that, that sort of that makes it really handy um and it worked in my favor much later so um I was doing that. Every time we got a nice stoush, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just drive off. I'd hammer the shit out of them. We got, I got one big one, which was just bullshit. Um, and I was by myself. <laughs> Went on for four hours. And, uh, and the Yanks had to get me out of that one. I don't think I would have come out of that. But it was, I've it had some fairly interesting drone footage of the whole thing. I was like, um, that was over two drivers. They, the Macedonians ring me up and went on sort of chilling out, waiting for it to get dark. So I only moved at night, you don't get shot at. And I had night, my own night vision and all that shit from Iraq, so I just run at night. Um, yeah, so they wanted to move these two trucks. I'm going, why? I was going, wait, no, we've got to move them now. But why? They're empty. Just wait till it gets dark. I'll bring them back tonight. No, no, they've got to come down. So we drive down there and we got hammered. And um, the truck drivers, after I briefed them, not to jump out of their trucks and run away and hide. I was like, if you get hit, just keep driving. Unless you're disabled, just go. And we'll just deal with it and catch up there. So they stop their trucks and get out, jump out and run away. Um, we found one body without a head a bit later on. And like, there was no blood around, so I don't know if he, they grabbed him and hacked his head off or it was someone else, I don't, I don't know. But we took the body back anyway. Um, the other guy was hiding in a culvert and the, the tully we couldn't find him and I'm like I'm not he's a with Pashtun him. Afghanis yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, he's under the road isn't this is like in, towards the end of the fight because that's the only reason we're still there because I was looking for this prick <laughs> he's hiding under the road and this thing is about this one we're watching these dudes walk down the side of the road and like, they hell guys and one of my dudes is like no 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 they're Talib 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 and this dude sticks a PKM under the road and goes Brah! and lets off a, a big long burst that's where he is. He's hiding under the road. That's where he's been the whole time. And so we, we rolled up on these dudes and sorted him out and um, dragged this guy out and he had shot the shit, lost his leg in the end. But we got him out, TK'd it off, threw him in the back. And, and then I'd been talking, we had this young yank who was XMP, who was actually really good. He ended up getting killed over there after I ended up in jail. But um, he uh, he managed to get it air support for me through this other but they were gonna they're gonna put in a mortar fire put, a fire mission at one point with 120s and I'm, I'm sort of on the sat phone to him and i'm thinking he with sat phone to my top to their top to the fire line <laughs> let's just run with a loom mission so my guys get all this know what they're shooting at uh, because this stage is getting pretty dark um, and i was the only one who sort of had the decent gear to, to deal with that so that, yeah, that made life a bit easier. And, um, anyway, so we're coming out of there and, and this same captain who ran this fob managed to get our air support. I don't know what it was uh, that late in the game. It probably phew, it was either a spec or something, but they were, they were smashing up the road pretty much with, with 20 mil anyway. And I just didn't even bother to knock the stump off the fucking <laughs> surf driving along the side of the road, bounce, hitting every fucking culvert and sump play that uh, car died on the way back in we got this dude into there um i had like three guys who were pretty dinged up but they're okay but this truck driver with a little lost leg and shit sort of like 
and sort that out. And he, t- he turned up about three weeks later and he just wanted to say thank you for getting him out. I thought it was pretty cool. It's actually one of the cooler things I did. Um, but yeah, that sort of rattled a few people in the company because they, everybody else, oh yeah, I've done this. And, all that. and I'm like, man, eh, I'm just going to the pub. And, but when people stick around, because it's telling me to leave these guys here and they're the Afghans, who cares? I'm like, what are we doing here? You know, this is how, how the hell are you? They, and after that, they couldn't, get convoys to go out because oh no no we want the Australian to come because he, he fights and they just will refuse to drive <laughs> because they've been out with the Macedonians and the Macedonians go fuck this show the MP5s and just bail and my guys are all running I ran pretty heavy I was my gun trucks all had um, 12.7s on them <laughs> so this is yeah, don't fuck around <laughs> I had a recallless rifle but it was really hard to get um ammo for it but it was good when we had ammo and we had AGS 17 which is probably the most fun thing I've ever had but yeah again we couldn't get enough it, we, ammo was okay to get for that but the link because it's got that weird ass belt that goes in there it was plenty enough so yeah after that one I used to have to turn up sometimes to where they were staged in a convoy from usually hung over and just go yeah I'm here and I'll just get back in the car because at least they think I'm there <laughs> Where's the Australian? Oh, he's out looking for Taliban at home, passed out. Or, um, but yeah, it was getting, I was getting a bit fucking stupid, to be honest. Uh, I wouldn't have lasted too much longer. Anyway, so because of all this, there was a few other things that ha- issues that happened at the company, and um, I basically you know, fuck this, I'm out here. And to these two young American blokes I've been training up um, took a convoy and they got hit actually inside the city gates in Kabul. And where they, and when I went out there and had a look around afterwards, the RPGs had been fired over the top of the police station. Oh no, this is this is all wrong. Why would they even use that? And so yeah, okay. So I met up with them and they, they had this guy who used to work for the warlord who was one of our scouts on the road and he was actually I'd had run ins with him before because one of the bosses at the company he was a, also an XSF guy, he wasn't there long. And he did some other stuff as well, but he said, just follow him one night and just see if he actually goes out and does his shit. And I had a night off. So he goes out to scout the roads and make sure there's no Taliban. And he goes out, drives back to his house, goes to bed. Doesn't check. Doesn't check. So he's, he's telling everybody he's um, in charge of the convoy now. And, and um, then I turned up there. And at that stage, everybody had heard in the company that I'd left. And they were all... Okay, what's going on? And um, yeah, I've been doing some other stuff during the day and the days leading up to it, not with not a lot of sleep, so I was a bit sort of ragged. And basically, it was like three. I'm watching this dude with the MVGs, and he's he's talking to the Turk. And he's got his pistol out, he's muzzling him in the face. I'm just going, okay, if he doesn't want to go, tell him. Put his weapons and his ID card out, outside of his, his window and drive away right now. So, so the, the guy that was supposed to be checking, on, checking the room for the Taliban, mm. went home. To, went home. Yeah, yeah. You caught him out. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. But that, that was sort of the internal thing. And, and I said, "Why are we paying this guy?" Said, oh, because he works for the he works for um, House of Dean, the, the warlord guy. And we can't. We've got to have him. Sam, because it gives us a bit of leverage when we're dealing with the cops and shit, the locals. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So I just did my own thing, pretty much. I did everything else that no one else wanted to do or didn't, or couldn't do or were too scared to do. I did, I did some pretty good stuff. But, um, so, yeah, this, this, um, this guy's taken over the convoy. They did the same thing. Till the Americans can go home, this, this is not safe for them. It was bullshit because I went up there and I'm, I'm looking at the tracks. There's three guys. I think there's no fucking way. Right next to the fucking police station. Oh, um, it's not cops. And one of the fucking sets of tracks is wearing American boots. Um, we well, issue American boots to Afghans. And they're not the same as the police boots. So it's not policemen. And others were just flip flops. So I'm going, okay, they're pulling this shit again. So I basically said, okay, fuck off. Go. Give us your weapons and fuck off. He's muzzling everybody. Not everyone ever went to the car and one more fucking time I'm going to go over there and beat the shit out of him. Which is exactly what I did. And as he saw me storming over there, and I had an M4 across my chest, I flicked the MVGs up and reached into the thing and the pistol comes up. So it's like, 
alas. He saw you trying to fill him in, and he and he pulled pulled the yeah, pistol out. Yeah, it was, and I'd been running over there at that stage for a year, um, and I got shot out a fair bit, and I was a bit sort of known for not taking any shit from anyone. And so, all right, we'll crack on then, because there's not a lot you can do. And um, opened the boot of the car, all the drugs, and I. Awesome. He's dead now, I took it. Yeah, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. he took four rounds straight through the chest, so point blank rounds. And, and of course, it was, it was funny about it afterwards, the amount of statements they had, but no one actually heard it because, well, I always ran suppressors on my gear at night. And um, even with 223, it's not that loud when it's jammed into somewhere. Like, chunk, chunk. It, was, it was just sort of pop, pop, pop. But uh, yeah, so, okay. Put him in the back, let's go crack on. So we did. And then by the time we got the convoy going, it's getting the light. And I'm like, fuck me, I'll get rid of this car. I'm driving around a carload of drugs and a dead body. It's not good anywhere, any country. <laughs> I did. So the, this is, there was a con, you were protecting the convoy at the same time. Yep. I didn't realize that. Yeah, okay. no, there's a convoy there. So right, and, I, and I said to the, the Yanks, I said, look, just crack on with the convoy. I'll sort this shit out. I've got to get rid of this car because it's, it's got all this fucking it's crap in it. And uh, when I'd gone out, my, my car that I had set up, that was my car. I had been I'd already one of the Macedonians had grabbed it and taken it to fucking Jalalabad. So I've, I've got one of the boss's cars and I didn't know where any of the shit was in the back. I'm like, fucking God. So we pulled up. Now, right, I get everything out of the car that, that belongs to the company, that ties the, the company to this with those, that shit in the back. Leave that there. Drugs in the body. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> Here's the thing. I thought it was pretty obvious to take the body out because we're going to take that out. Oh, yeah, he fucked up and he got shot. Oh, well. But I was getting rid of the car and the drugs. That was the <laughs> that was what I was going through in my head. And I'm looking at it. Because of the mail, the Yanks, um, we used to get it, uh, given um, thermite grenades and destroy the, the mail trucks if the, the trucks got disabled. And the, the Connex was on the back and we used to put them with the doors facing against the cab so you couldn't get in there. And they were tagged anyway, so you, you couldn't really. But... Yeah, one or two thermite grenades and RPGs. We carried RPGs for the same reason, for destroying the mountain. So they were allowed to have. Um, In the event that the convoy got bumped and you had this, you had the yeah, this, yeah, of course that's not. Of course that's not what happened. We used used everything for everything, but um, yeah, we we had the gear there. So I'm looking for these thermite grenades in the back of the truck and um, the, the the dudes who were with, which weren't my guys, so just people who worked at the office who came with me because oh, because they're the only people around um i've got mm. we're going um i go right you got everything out of the truck because because we're at stay like we're in the middle of just new guys and where it's not really cool to be fucking hanging around and um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And I'm, all right cool I walk back to the car and I'm, where's the body oh it's in there <laughs> oh, okay let's go <laughs> because and afterwards, everyone said, well, why did he didn't show any remorse? Or why didn't he? And you know as well as I do, it's, it's that junior leadership thing. That's one of the first things. That you don't lose your rag about anything when things don't go your own way or pear shape, whatever. You just go, all right, next option, and just crack on, which is what I did. How did they, how did they, how did they react when you killed the guy? They were, they were laughing about it. The Afghans. Was it, I thought the guy was, um, was the son of a warlord. Yeah, he was. Were they not flapping? Well... No, because they weren't from the same tribe, and they didn't like him either. Okay. But they were the first ones that straight me under the bus afterwards. Oh yeah, no, I saw this. Yeah, so because this guy's one of the reasons this warlord worked at the company is because his connections to the NDS. The NDS got hold of me pretty fucking quick. And um, NDS, uh, National Director of Security, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. Is. The, that's and secret police. Yeah, slant, I Gestapo, I slant, arsehole, or whatever. Poses, maybe. Yeah, I remember we used to, if we, we, we take, we take prisoners occasionally when I was serving. And, and then, as soon as we knew they'd gone off the NDS, you knew you'd see them back yeah. on the ground too. They were just, just so corrupt. Yeah. They were, um, but that, that's where it got interesting because I went into a bit of a hole for a, a couple of days, but, um, a mate of mine who ran a paramedical company over there had this young guy, this young ex ranger medic working for him. Um, who won the Bronze Star in Iraq and 
him and I got on extremely well. And we earlier before this happened, we'd actually been sniffing around Blackwater for a job in Somalia. Yeah. Because he goes, yeah, no, so he used to work in Blackwater. He said, yeah, yeah, we'll get you in, man. It'll be awesome. We'll go to go to Somalia and get some African time. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. So that's what we were actually planning on doing, but sort of got playing out. Anyway, so when all this happened, everyone at the company sort of dropped me a bit, surprisingly. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to get, because they picked me up at the airport, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to get knocked here. What do you mean the picture at the airport? NDS, guys. Right. Were you flying out? Yeah, I was just, fuck this, I'm out here. Just like the next day? And it was, no, it was, yeah, pretty much. And it was sort of, it was sort of, um, one of those things was, do I go to bag room or do I go, because we, we were running on white cat cards. I, I was pretty much, I had rank and everything, you know, one of those, one of the good contractor cards. And I could pretty much use the system. Anyway, so I literally tossed a coin because I'm thinking, do I, do I manage, do I take the drive or I'll go there? Because I knew as soon as I was on bag room, I was safe. There's no fucking way no one that could touch me, but it was, again, it was, I don't know, about getting there. At that point, we were near the airport, and I toss a coin. Airport wins. Okay, let's go. Drive or fly? What was the airport? Come um, good ball. Yeah. Oh, yeah, got you. So, I actually got warned out by one of the Macedonian chicks um, whose husband was our, our um, well, operations manager in title, but he didn't actually do a lot. I barely speak English at the best of time, so anyway, but she could. And she was actually quite competent as a QE, so um, I got on well, and I treated most of the Macedonian women there as I would treat most women nicely, not the way they do, so of course that goes a long way. And she rings me up and tells me that he, he basically sold me out to the NDS guys. and Her husband did. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, right No worries. Thanks for that. But by that stage, though, they'd already had hold of me. And, um, yeah, spent the next seven years in jail. Three death sentences. I'm not sure how they were going to manage that one. Huh? But, yeah, that would be interesting. Three death sentences? Yeah, it's sort of how the system when, works. When they, so you, so when they, when they, when they picked you up, mm. wait, how did that go down? Tell me about that. Okay, so you sort of just know, you know, you see that I was, I was talking to the cops and just sort of, sort of ass hanging out there, I'm like, fuck, 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 fuck. But I was like, yeah, just trying to be chilled. And, and then the same cops I was talking to and have a bit of a laugh with when I was going through customs, now they're walking around and they've got a photo of my company ID. And I'm like, ah, fuck, here we go. And you, and you sort of go, yeah, they just come, oh, you got to come with us. So I just rang one of my mates and just left the phone on. And I'm going, so where are you taking me? You take me back to the police station. You take me to the police station, the airport, and, and basically give you a rundown of what was going on. And this guy goes, there for me, there for me, there for me. So at least someone sort of knew what was going on. And uh, when I got up the thing, handcuffed, got a fucking, and of course, walk into the office of the police chief in um, in the airport and, and house it in the warlord sitting in there and he's fucking fuming he's just, he's just fucking wants to get his hands away and they cuff me straight away put the cuffs on him. as soon as the cuffs are on beat the crap out of me no, <laughs> so I fucking go to touch up so that's awesome they're pretty good they stayed away from the face and I was like yeah you're smart that's, that's good that's good um, and then they hand me over the NDS and I'm thinking oh fuck now and uh, so Casey has worked this out and he's uh, he was the one who ended up going to the Australian embassy and letting them know otherwise I would have fucking the ex-range the guy you called on the phone yeah he was one of them anyway and uh, he eventually found me three days later and and as soon as as soon as the embassy started asking questions because I I was at the NDS and they transferred me to the to a normal police place I'm thinking hmm okay maybe I'm not going to get killed and that was mainly because of this kid. He managed to track me. He knew once there was eyes on, I was good. But at that point, I was off the off the books, so to speak. And I was mm. the passport was already stamped that I left the country. You know, <laughs> some of the shit that could happen. And yeah, you know as well as I do, the NDS tend not to um, play games when it comes to that. They just get what they want and they kill you. Simple as that. Um, or hand you over to Taliban. Huh? Oh, that. Do a yeah. swap. Um, they hung me off a wall for most of the time. I still got like nerve damage in. What do you mean? Just cuffed to what? Yeah, cuffed, hanging like that, sort of right up. And, and yeah, my, this hand doesn't work as quite as well as what it used to, just because of 
the radio or nav. What was the day, day like in that? So, sorry. And that, just, this is only a couple of days. So it's a couple of days. Yeah. See, still the NDS. Yeah. Just like in the local. local yeah. And, then, and then, then they put me in the local one and basically the remand centre but until I went to court, the first court anyway. I assume it was that after. <laughs> Shit. That was a while. Um, probably three weeks. What was, what was, what was their accusation? Because obviously you killed the guy. But what was their version? Of, what was their version of the story? Their version of the story was um, pretty much I just lost lost my mind and started shooting people. That's like I said. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was how it all read, and, and apparently I, I said that too because of, because of a um, a uh, confession turned up there, and I'm like, what's this? <laughs> I'm not saying any of this. And I, I pretty much stuck to it guns the whole way through with the story it's, and it just it just changed anyway were the they were changing the story as they saw fit well okay so the one that came from it came from the uh, company there was a bit of it coming out of the company basically to protect themselves um, so they said they gave the version of what, what happened what did they yeah. say what did the company say it was same shit essentially you lost your mind and- yeah pretty much um well, I, so they, um, and the lawyer I got, that was actually, the, the lawyer was on a list that was uh, actually supplied by the Australian government. And this guy, he was so dodgy. He was still asking for money, like, after we got rid of him months later. <laughs> it's so wonderful. But he, he'd got turn up. The first one, he turned up, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? This is like the first court. And we go in there, and I'm so, someone's office like this. So you're, it's an Afghani lawyer. Did you have any representation from the Australian, Australian embassy? Yet? Yes, they did get that. I, I will say this, the DFAT people, the um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, went over and above what they... Uh, a lot of it had to do with who was in power at the time. Like when it first happened, we had a um, Labor government. I think Julia Gillard was the Prime Minister then. Um but the, the staff at the embassy were really good. The, the young girl who, who started out, I think she got herself in a bit of shit because she was working a bit hard, spending. And the thing is, the um, <laughs> pretty much 90% of the uh, security guys there were guys I'd either worked with in the army, worked with in Iraq. One of my closest friends actually ran the security gig at the embassy. <laughs> he was a SAS guy. He's, he's been around for a bit. And uh, so every time they turned up, that's how I got things done. I have a quick chat at the embassy and then the, the security team is like, listen, you need money and sort of shit like that. Um, a lot of, I did have a lot of friends come out of the woodwork and uh, it certainly cleared the wheat from the chaff in that respect. You know, you know who stands by at the end of the day. Um, eventually, we, um, yeah, so we, we do the first court and it was open in like 10 minutes and I'm like, what was that, like a prelim thing or what? No, 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 no. Cuttle, man. It's, it's, that's it. Alas. Okay. That's it, what? I say, so yeah, I keep switching in the day. Um, so at that point, I couldn't speak much of the language. And, uh, and I said, no, yeah, you basically, that's it. That's the first court out of the way. You get sentenced to death. I'm like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> so it's sort of a bit of a, you sort of took me a day or two to sort of digest that. Oh, all right. And so they they tried to send me out to Polacharki and the embassy got me to send them back. When they sent me out there, because I wouldn't pay money to the guy who was at the um, at the remand place because it was so overcrowded and you could pay money to be shifted into a decent room and all the rest of it, it was on the biggest road. He made sure I got sent to the punishment wing of the jail just to basically soften you up. And, yeah, it was the first the first time around, it was pretty fucking rough. How does that, how does that work, the punishment wing? Tell me that. It was about as bad as you can possibly imagine, cool. but you're locked up. You're pretty much locked down 23 hours a day. But what's your sound like? It's uh, it's about as big as I am tall. Fucking hell. Square. <laughs> I think that thing was actually about 11 wide, and it was about 8 long. Feet. Yeah. So that was no, pretty... No, I take it, no bad. Nah, just on the floor. Yeah. Had, a, had a squat, but that didn't work. Had, had a basin, but that didn't work. You know, it was, it was um, yeah, it was different. 
So I, I, the first time I was there for about 10 days and come back a bit of a fucking mess. It was, it was like being in, in the fucking bag. <laughs> it was rough. And then um, after that, they sort of left me alone a bit at the Ramam place when I got back there. And they actually are looking after him, his government, so we better leave him alone. The second time around, um, same deal, second court, go in and come back out. But that time my lawyer was trying to give this big statement. He basically got told to shut up by the judge. How did the second court come around then? So this is like sent, a... Sent you to death in the first one? Yep. Did they tell you what, what, how you're going to be killed? Yeah, it was hanging there. That's the same way do it. And, I, and I've actually seen them do that. They're pretty shit at it. Considering how long they've been at war, they're actually crap at killing each other, right? <laughs> You'd think they'd be better at it, but they're... What are we going to do? Oh, we'll sit there, we'll throw stones at her until she dies. Bury up to her waist in the ground and we'll throw rocks at her until she's dead. Yeah, that's going to work. Yeah. So, the second time, yeah, same deal. Uh, the judge was shit. The whole thing was shit. Third time, same deal. And then... How far are we now to your... This this is like over the space of a year, I guess. And in the end, I'm like, fuck it. I'm just going to go. And anyway, they're, they're, I come across this bunch of Nigerians and Africans. They weren't all Nigerians. In the neck? In the neck. They were all drug runners. And um, got on pretty well with them because I'm... Um, yeah. And then when, when I got out to Polichaki, we got they put me in with them. We basically had a whole, whole floor to ourselves. And there was a couple of other foreigners in there. There was a Russian guy who was a he was ex-military, but he went over there. He converted to Islam and went over there to fight. He was a good dude. I got on pretty well with him. There was a couple of other. There was a Ukrainian electrician. But he died when we were in there. A bunch of Gurkhas just getting smashed. With, they'd smash Gurkhas all the time or Nepalese all the time with Why passport shit. Oh, really? I yeah, just don't like them because of the whole Buddhist thing. You know? yeah. Like I said, the way things are with the companies, everyone at that point had swifted, uh, shifted focus to Iraq because that's where the money was. So, dudes just weren't looking out for the guys, especially the Gurkhs that are coming through the fucking airport. Unless it was a Gurk, he'd done a few trips and knew how to handle himself like a proper girl when he's been in the in the British Army. But they were, they were high, like our company, they just hiring Nepalese. Oh, they're Gurkhas. No, they're fucking not. He's never been in the Army. Well, he said he, said he has been. No, he's in the fucking Army. Yeah, and, and essentially they did nothing. And then we had one guy who was a, a sergeant in one of the Gurkha battalions and he was, he was awesome. He basically was running one of the gigs in, in Kandahar for a long time until... He had to get out because he was part, and he was the one who brought it up. He said, I still don't have a proper visa, work visa on my thing. I was like, get the fuck out. So we got him out through CAF. Um, so yeah, and, he, and these guys basically, if they got in the shit, oh, we on your Nepalese, no, he was a fuck. Mm. Which I thought was pretty shit. But um, there's one guy who was in there, he'd been in there for like seven years because he just refused to pay the fucking bribes or the fines. He's just, no, I'm not going to do it. Mm. And he's still there. <laughs> Eventually, he he, he, he reneged and he, he did get out. Did the um sorry? Yep. Did the when uh, when the incident happened? Mm. Did the so there was the other the, the Afghanis there were, were from a different tribe, but the witnesses. Mm. Did they oh, come the forward? Tribes. Did they come forward and say no. no? No, there was no no one turned up at the at the thing. There was no they didn't call any witnesses. No, it was, it was, so it was, it was, it was basically against theirs and it's an Afghan. Yeah, Afghan, yeah. Um, and you could you can't argue it. I mean, like I said, the second court they basically I went in there and tried to play the game a bit, and, and my lawyer starts giving a spiel. I didn't understand the language then, like I said, but. You basically just said, no, nah, shut up. Don't want to hear it. Sit down. So you don't get to say anything anyway. You know, I mean, there's no point. Um, <laughs> to top it off, the, the company, the only thing the company really did was send an interpreter who was a guy I belted this shit out of one night because <laughs> I came in. I, would, I, was, I, was, I was actually I was out and on the road and... Um, Oh no, sorry, no, this, this, this happened another time. Someone rang me, one of the, one of the call signs rang me while I was out on the piss and they were there in a contact and they said, oh, we're trying to get all the fucking, we're trying to get all the ops room, we can't get hold of anyone. So I'll, I'll, I'll head back and see what the fuck's going on. So this guy's sitting at the desk watching porn on the fucking company computers and the phone's like, right, 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 because these guys are in contact and he just can't be arsed. He's, 
you got to fucking slap him. So that, that's the guy that sent me a <laughs> so I, I'd give him a spear. I'd give him this big long spear. Like, and he'd just say like three words. And I'm like... <laughs> The guy who sent you as your interpreter it was someone you'd beaten up in the past. Yeah, because he was a dick, you know. It's like, yeah, this is not going well. Um, anyway, so I got, eventually, people start there. The government was going softly, softly, and we had a change in government um, in Australia. The coalition got back in, and they're a little bit more conservative. So we had um, Julia, uh, no, sorry, Julie Bishop took over. Um, as a foreign affairs minister, and, and she she was pretty well known. She was awesome as a politician. She went out, would have made a great prime minister, but she sort of kept it going, I think. And the DFAT people really really pushed. You know, at that point when it when it changed over, that's all right. Our gloves are off, and they they actually started doing stuff like a lot of stuff behind the scenes. I'll never know how much they actually did, but um, the feel of it was that they were just, they knew something was, everything was about it, it was bullshit. And considering every, all the staff had access to people who'd, who'd known me for 50 odd years because of their security, they would have been asking, I, mean, I know that for a fact. Um, so they knew something wasn't right about the whole fucking thing. And eventually they push, 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 and it gets, they managed to push it all the way over. This is over the, the seven year period. Eventually got it to the, the president and I said, "Look, there's the other the other big win I had was uh, meeting um, Kim Motley, an American lawyer, who would initially gone to Afghan to help set their judicial system up. So she she knew how it was supposed to work because she was one of the Americans working for the State Department to do that. And then she worked out there's more money to be made freelancing over there as a lawyer because it was no, she was the only Western lawyer in the country. That sounds a bit lethal to me, mate." She's Jesus. ballsy, man. She's scary. She, she, she did. She was just driving around by herself. Yeah, I don't need security. Fuck that. She and, won't. No, she was. Um, she's half Korean, half African American. Oh, okay. And she was Miss Wisconsin at one point. Um, so she's pretty good looking, and she uses it completely to her advantage. She knows when to put it, on, turn it on, and when not to. And of course, she she used it to. Buy, and she she was involved early in the piece. And, she, and, and then later on, for whatever reason, she pulled out. And then she came back and said, look, I'll, I'll do it for you for nothing. I'll get you out. I promise I'll get you out. I can't tell you when, but I will. And um, she did. And she just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Eventually, she got me a full pardon from the president. And it was sort of, yeah, go away quietly. Don't make any noise about it. Okay. That's what I did. So, took seven years to do, but... Uh, and you know, towards the end, it was it got a bit more interesting because I moved over to the um, Max Security Wing where they hold all the Taliban. Which prison is this? In Polacharki in, in Kabul. Um, so I got to meet all of the Taliban guys, and there was a couple of them that actually knew me from outside before. They knew I said, "You're the, you're the Australian guy," yes. and I'd be like wearing a long shirt and that, and they'd go, so, "I don't know what you're talking about." And they'd grab me and was, "Yeah, no, that's you." Oh, see all the tattoos. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, um, but um, I, met, I met one guy in there who was a Taliban mufti, and he was only a fairly young guy, but he spoke perfect English. And he was, and I learned a lot from him about how they how they work, how they do things. And I, and when you when you look at it from the Taliban's point of view, it's it's not that much different to like Northern Ireland. You know, it's it, it is one group of people who just look, just fuck off out of our country and leave us alone because that's what we want. You know, and then you got the AQ guys on the other side who just want to blow the world up and they're assholes and uh, then later on towards the end there's the ISIS guys coming in or the, the Daesh guys and everyone hates them they just got flogged by everybody but the Taliban guys they, they said look no one touch him he's with us leave him just leave him alone he's under our protection there's a whole oh, Pasht- Pashtun Wally I'm a guest so it works. What, what, sorry? Pashtun Wali is a thing that predates Islam. Oh, yeah, is this the yeah, community? Yeah. yeah. So if, on, if you invite them to your house, they're basically, you got to look after them. Interestingly yeah. enough, talking to... You, I'm going to grab a beer. Yeah. Talking to um, Hakimi about that. Yeah. He was... Um, I, yeah, please. Well, sorry, man. I asked him because he was only he was actually still at the Red Mosque in um, 
Pakistan came to him. When, this, when the war first kicked off and he was only for, and he's still in his 20s then and he said that he said the whole thing is he said the same thing that protects you is is um, is why we protected the sheikh when he was here and talking about um, Osama he said he, he was good for us he, his family gave, giving us money during the war against the Russians he was, and, and so he, he always had he always had safe passage in the country he said, but when when he blew up the when he attacked the Americans, he said there were there were a lot of people that weren't happy about it because they knew the Americans had come. The Americans trained our people. He said, he said my father was trained by the Americans. So it was it was interesting talking because essentially the Taliban and Mujahideen they're the same fucking guys. And you know when you look at it from their point of view, all their all their how their religion works, all that aside, what they're actually doing is actually. You can sort of see their point. It's like just fuck off, everyone, fuck off. This is our country, <laughs> you know. It's, but it was sort of like when 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 they did that, when they blew up the twin towers, they're like, "Fuck, here we go." All right then, and and they said, "Look, sorry, we can't give him up. We can't do that. How how can we?" And, and you know, they tried. Actually, they didn't just go fuck it. There was probably to give us some. Yeah, it's probably a bunch of young bucks going, yeah, fuck it, let them come because they just want to get in a fight and prove themselves because, again, that's an Afghan thing. But, uh, you know, the, talking, to, talk, talking to him about it, some of the older ones there, it's like, yeah, when, when it started this, because he said the Americans won't stop. We know they won't stop. They train us. And so, yeah, that's it started that. And But they were, they, were, they had... I mean, I, I, that's where I got my first phones from with the Taliban guys. They had a sat phone in the jail and they were running ops from inside the jail. I mean, that's brilliant. Was, they're not going to bomb this fucking place. <laughs> and you see, you'd see the rest of the, where the rest of the prisoners were living and you see the four the Taliban guys were on. It was spotless. They'd get up every morning and everyone would clean the floor and they'd polish it and everyone, it was someone's turn to cook. and that. Regiment, you know. Everyone else, drug dealers, murderers, fucking rapists, all the rest of it. Uh, just living there and fucking shit. I don't care. It's interesting, that. Mm. It's an interesting point of view to, uh, it's to, to that point of view that just, you know, go out of the country, leave, leave us be. Uh, <clears throat> um, and you can, you know, you can, I can understand it. Mm. Oh, but, see, but, so when, you, I mean, but, when you look at it from completely within their framework, yeah. it's it makes sense. It, that, yeah. But if you ignore everything else, like yeah. like the twin towers, like like um, like the well, the whole terrorism side of it, all the different organisations there. Yeah. And, but to hear it on a on an individual individual level, the, op, the opportunity to speak to people like that mm. on an individual level, I'm, I'm I'm assuming you're around these people all the time, you know. Mm. And you, you become oh, that was my mates. Friend. Yeah, well, I got on. I learned more about Islam from Hakimi, and like he, 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 he went. He made the point of explaining everything, even the whole thing between the Sunni and the Shia. Explained how, why would he be? Oh, well, oh, he didn't say it out and out, but he, he basically gave me the the groundwork on how Wahhabism has taken over and why it's done with the Saudis is basically to get all the young bucks out of the country so they don't cause shit back at home. Go off jihad somewhere else, that's why. So we'll give you some money off of you. And they're not going to cause shit at home then. That's how it works. But that itself, I mean, to talk to him about the Saudis, and it's like, okay. He said, yeah, he said, they're hypocrites. He said, from the start, you know. And I'm going, but you're all a hippie. He said, yes, I went to the Red Mosque, yes. But we take their money and we, we try to be the the best Muslims we can. They're hypocrites because they used Islam as a means to take land. He's dead right. That's exactly what they did. The House of Saud basically got this weirdo wandering around in the desert and said, we need a we need a priest to give us back and from a big fella to, so we can take over the whole peninsula and run Mecca and make money off that. And he went, all right. And um, yeah, fuck it, let's go. And that's, and that's essentially where it all started. That's, they're, the, they're the ones who start this shit. No one else. I don't know if you know anyone who's done any work over there for the royal family. And I, I, they only usually last about a year and they come back because it's just mm. shit. What, um, what was... 
I was living in the. What was it like being in the prison for seven years? I just, I mean, like, was it because, mate? Yeah, what was it like? Was it? Did you? Well, was, it, was it? Was it hard? Was it? Was they hard? Was it? It was mentally. What was it like? I, was, it was. It was hard to set the start. It was hard, and try because you didn't know what which way it was up, and that was you know. That was rough. And it was literally, you know, you'd climb over the fence and you're in Kabul and you could just duck around your mate's place and you'd be out of there. Afterwards, when I got out to Polichaki, it was actually easier because you had time. You know, you weren't moving anywhere. And you go, all right. And you know, just do what we're used to, man. You just get into a routine and stick with it. Fuck what they're doing. Don't worry really what anyone else is doing. It's just do your shit. And um, where, where I was first with the Nigerians and other foreigners, because we were sort of fenced off and I, I never really went out. I didn't need to. I, I, Africans used to look after. I, I had mates bring this stuff in for me. I'd get like a, a couple of cases of MREs every month and um, they'd bring in a bit of fresh once in a while. We could get stuff at the canteen depending on where you were was how, how good your canteen was. So when we were there, it was actually pretty good. And we had comms and you had a couple of TVs and shit. It was, it was all right. How violent was it? What was the violence like? Yeah, pretty fucking bad. I mean, that's that's not real. I, I, I did, and then I said, look, I'm going to end up getting fucking killed, and that was part of the reason I stayed there, because I, I don't back down. And, anyway, and, just, and just the random shit that used to happen, especially around Ramadan. Where, you know, you get about two weeks in, everyone gets a bit punchy, because no one's eating during the day, no sleep. Uh. Instead of going to sleep after they've eaten at night, they just stay up all night talking shit, mm. and they stay awake all day going, I'm so hungry. So... I'll be in there fried onions and shit. Get out of here. <laughs> so, little people losing their minds. Um, How often did you get targeted in there? Uh, once or twice. It didn't really happen in, in the big one because I just kept my head down. There was a few times I battered a few people and that was the end of it. And then the Nigerians would come in there and they're not small people at the best of times. And they're, they're a bit like Kiwis in a way. They're just genetically endowed. They're, they don't do anything, but they're fucking massive, all of them. And mm. it's just, yeah, they don't take no shit at all. But they, they're actually better at the, the politics thing. Like a lot of Africans are. It's, 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 the whole tribal thing is they're used to that that level of politics. And, like, ah, da, da. and, and Nigerians, Nigerians don't do any of that shit. They, they always talk their way out of something. They're you little gangsters here. No, they're, they're like that. They're especially out of this side. They all live <laughs> over the side of the road. Um, but they, uh, it's, uh, it wasn't too bad there. But it was shit. And then later on, we went, when we went to the high security wing, that was ran by a guy who had actually been trained by the English and the Americans. And he's an ex-military guy as well. And he was actually okay. When I got there, he goes, right up. And he took everything off his DVD players, the TVs, everything. Okay, he's got phones. Hand them over. And I tell you, if you hand them over to me, I'll give them to you once every 10 days. That was the start of it. Because oh. you're foreigners, but that's the only reason. And, when, and that was like proper jail. And that's where the Taliban guys were. And that was like, Fuck, okay. So, and then after a while, it sort of was every week and then it was every couple of days and then towards the end there, I mean, I had, had a phone in my room all the whole time and he was like, he said, you don't cause any trouble. Because at that point, I was the only one there. I was the only foreigner there. And, um, but yeah, I got tired and there was a bunch of gangsters in there. They, they were in at one point and they let them out. They bribed their way out. And they, they were back in within three months. They fucking kidnapped some kid and fucking killed him. <laughs> so, but, fucking stupid shit. But they tried they tried to rape me in the yard and that was pretty fucking bad. It was a good fight. Oh, actually. Yeah. yeah. It was, yeah it was, cause I, I, you know, again, I wasn't paying much attention to the language then and I, was, I just knew something was up. I got fucking king it from the side and just, okay, now I know what they're doing. And, and it's like, yeah, just had a go. Broke my ankle. Got a couple of broken ribs out of it. <laughs> this fat fucking jumped on me as a, but I did all right for myself and they backed off and then that same afternoon I went back out in the yard and trained anyway broken ribs and I'm like fucking hell just so they no and, and that's when the Taliban stepped down and said right anyway next one touch thing we're going to cut your fucking head off simple as that and I got left alone and, the, and then they shifted me after what the Africans eventually all got out and then um, I ended up down the down on my own and towards the end, I mean, I was pretty well set up. I had fucking sat, or well, not, I was, yeah, so it was sat. I had, what, 72 channels on the TV, 
had a phone. I had like a <laughs> smartphone and they had decent comms. Well, it was, it was, yeah. How big was your room in that place? Um, mm. It was probably about in metres. Uh, three by three by eight with a bathroom on it. I was in there by myself. Yeah, it was, it was good. And I, I, I sent, at that point, I was cooking for myself um, because I was the only one in there who really knew anything about how to patch holes and people. I was always getting first aid shit in there because that always goes that people You were in giving first aid to people? Yeah, because you know, there's no doctors there. No, there's fucking nothing there. There was a doctor there, but he when he, the doctor that was out of jail, what he did was... Once the Americans are giving him all the kit, you know, probably a million dollars worth of fucking gear in a proper clinic, stripped it, sold it in town, oh, fucked off. Yeah, it was fucking yeah. So, so the prison was like, yeah. Yeah. so you were like do- doctoring. <laughs> I'll get you a long way. People getting stabbed and shit. I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> was, um, was bribery ever an option for you to get out? Yeah, but I didn't want to go that route. You ain't fucking. But the thing is that one of the Africans sort of summed it up. He, he, you know, a Nigerian guy who was a professional smuggler, he'd been in jail in Pakistan. So said, the difference between paying a bribe in Afghanistan and paying a bribe in Africa, in Africa, you get a result. You pay for a result. In, in Afghanistan, you might as well burn your money. You just throw money at nothing, and then eventually something might happen. Could just take it and fuck you up. Could just take it. That was, yeah. That's just how they are. How close did you get to actually being, um, actually being, um, uh, uh, kill as in as in uh, hung I don't think they were going to do it I think I just wanted to see what they, see what had happened I mean once the company paid the family zebra and once you've done that you're off the fucking the company paid what? Um, blood money okay essentially and, and it sounds like it's a bribe but it's not because that it's part of fucking an Afghan law a Muslim law that you have to pay an zebra to get out from under the fucking knife that's, that's it. That's how it works. Because you, you killed, because yeah, you killed the guy. His family owes you yeah. money. A compensation. Yeah, essentially. So, but the, why did the company do that? To well, sit for basically, him. basically, that it was a couple of mates had a yarn to them and, and put it in no, no uncertain terms. That was the way they should go because my two laptops went missing, of course. But there was a whole bunch of company emails and a bunch of other stuff on there that probably would have put them in a bit of a bad light even though they did the, the laptops went missing the cloud cloud storage wasn't really a thing there but I used to email anything I found interesting to myself and it was just kept somewhere in hot, various hotmail accounts so it was it was sort of oh shit okay um, so they they come out and my um, my sister especially working alongside my mates from the army really got that fucking the ball rolling on that Basically, pressure. Um, the other, the other interesting part of that story is the person whose house we're sitting in right now. Um, her and I had started going out. Uh, it, it wasn't really that serious at the time either. We're just when I was over there, over there, and um, before you got Nick. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah and, and it was sort of like a comeback, and then. Um, yeah, she stuck by me for through the majority of it. I mean, it was only towards the end she just couldn't. Well, it wasn't really towards the end, but the last two years or so, three years or so, she fucked, basically broke it off, but didn't neglect to tell me she was sucked a bit. But she should get. It, it, it's all good. She did come over there and come over and see me twice while I was in there, which was fucking amazing. Oh, you got visits, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, they did too. But B, B actually flew over like in the first like you know, go in. Went in July. 2008. Yeah, no, nine. And um, she was over, she came over end of August, November ish, I think. She came straight over pretty much. And um, she came over again a few years later when I was at Polar Charky. And then it just got too much, I mean, having that contact. In hindsight, it was probably a bad thing. I mean, the, the having contact with something outside is great, but. Then there's two people in jail, not one. And that sucks. And thinking about it now, that, that really was fucking rough on her and I was shooting her. But so she hooked up with another guy, but when she found out, I, I came, I told her, she was one of the first people I told her I was out. I just sent her a message and then I was in Kabul. 
you know, hung around there for a week and basically until I got my passport, my emergency passport shit sorted out so I'd get the fuck out of there. Um, and then I came over here and saw her in February and she fucked the new guy off and, and or the guy off and she came over and met me in, in um, Thailand when I was over there. We swanned around over there for a month. How did the release come out? Huh? How did the release come out? The release... The release, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> that was, um, because they fuck with you. Afghans, you know, you've been there, you fucking, do you know how cruel they are as a people? It's, if, if there's something below you, you fuck with it. That's what you do. So you too. Oh yeah, no, no, you're gonna get, you're gonna get out. Inshallah. The fuck. There's, 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 there's just fuck off. I, I, I was, I was, tra- I was just finished training and I'm fucking doing stuff there and, and this guy comes up. You gotta go. Where am I going? Alas, Buru, Australia. Yeah, fuck off. Get away from me. Because I, I, I used to lock myself in the room. I was here by myself. I had my own padlock and shit. So they couldn't fucking get in there if they tried. And uh, no, no, no. And eventually they got this guy who spoke English, which is actually pretty cool because he'd been stabbed in a fight with some other prisoners, this cop. And I thought he was dead because they said, no, no, he was killed. And I was like, oh. And he, he turns up there and he's in civvies and shit, because he spoke pretty good English. And, he's um, a prison guard, basically. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm going, oh, fuck, I thought you were dead. And he goes, no, 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 I'm still alive. I was very sick for a while. I'm like, fuck, good to see you, man. Goes, what's, so what's going on? He says, oh, no, you're being released. Because I'd been on the phone with Kim the night before having a bit of a rant, which was good. It was how I dealt with things most of the time. I'd bring someone up and just <laughs> was a dick. And they're like, yeah, shut up, idiot. Next day, I'd be fine. So... I'm going, okay, maybe it's on. And, and then I get a mess of funny f- text from Kim saying, that's it, we're done. Pack your bags. Like, cool. So I'm throwing everything in the fucking left mustard and stuff there and it's just shit. So. Kim was the American lawyer. Yeah. 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 And my mate, Ivan, who was the guy who'd been running the security, the XSAS guy who'd been running security for the embassy for about four different companies over the years and then went fuck it and he was working for another bunch out there he had a guy he had links to the some of the, the prison hierarchy so he sort of knew what was going on so I go to this office and he's there and I don't know what's going on and he goes you tell me hmm. so have a bit of a yarn and then Kim turns up and there was this other lawyer from the um, Wall Street Journal who'd been out to see me a couple of times lawyer sorry a reporter and she was still, she, I, she was the only reporter I spoke to the whole time I was there. Basically, because the first time she came out and had a yarn, and um, I said, Look, I don't, I can't talk about it in here, but in here. He said, Well, I'm actually doing a story on your old boss. I'd like to talk to you about that. I'm like, Okay, interested. I said, Well, tell you what, when I get out, we'll square it away. This is like a new year leading up and she goes okay do you need anything next time I come out to see you and I said yeah coffee's always good and I said yeah she, fuck she's going to come out here and um, she turns up what two weeks later with this jar of coffee and goes yeah just come out for a chat and um, didn't ask me any questions just came out for a yarn and she spoke perfect Farsi you know, she, and, huh. she, and she was Italian they had Italian her old, her old man was she was like a late child, but her old man had fought against with the Red Brigades against the Germans in World War Two. She's fucking interesting as well. We were talking about that this, that one day. Actually. Anyway, so afterwards, um, she basically signed me out because and okay, who's representative from the embassy? Everyone's sitting there going, "Ah, oh, fuck!" Looking at each other. Just, just, just gets up, grabs a pen, and signs <laughs> the release for because there's no one from the embassy there. They could because they couldn't because of the security risk at the time they couldn't get fucking the company who took taken over security was one of the reasons why Ivan left and they just wouldn't move no, so you no, couldn't get the embassy into the prison to sign your release papers to go so who signed it Jess Jess Denali the Wall Street Journal lawyer, <laughs> reporter <laughs> she just gets up and signs a fucking thing I mean you keep a look at each other product laugh because she just did it she didn't even bat an eyelid so, there you go. so fuck are you <laughs> so I caught up with her a year later in Melbourne and we went out in the piss. It was a fucking good night, actually. It was fucking mad. Awesome, awesome reporter. Really knows his shit. Proper journo. 
What's her name? Uh, Jess Denardi. Jess Denardi. Yeah, she's actually getting posted over here next year. She's um, going to be up in Jobu. She's hooked up with a guy who's who's been working in Washington the last couple of years. She's been there, but um, he's getting posted to the Yank Embassy apparently. So she's going to be in this neck of the woods. It's just terrifying because she's um, <laughs> yeah. So she's a bit of a character. She's going to get herself in trouble in Africa. Actually, she she didn't get herself in trouble in Afghanistan, so she, I think she'll be right. <laughs> What happened when you got out? Where so you came up? You just came up here and then. So, did, 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 did anyone from agencies want to talk to you about stuff you'd learned on the well, inside? That was, that, was I'm trying to dress up. that was a surprising thing. Uh, uh, you must have. So a... Okay, well, we, we, I went to the embassy to pick up my gear, and I f- I'm figuring they're going to they're be all over me. Fuck me, I was just, and, but I think it was because I was so open with him the whole time I was in there. I mean, anything of interest that I come across, I just pass it on. I mean, what to the embassy? Yeah, yeah. Anything I heard, I mean, I could. To the point, you know, there was a couple of times when he came. He said, "Those visitors, visitors you get, are they going to be coming anytime soon?" I said, oh, "I'm not going to tell you that. You're a fucking Taliban." And he go, "Ah, yes, it is the war." This is a, this is a problem. I said, well, if they are, it's probably not a good idea to come tomorrow. And you walk away. And I'll right and get the fucking phone out and yeah, ring up my thing in the embassy or send a message that don't move. Just so I can sit tight. Had that sort of relationship with the guy. And I actually rang him up and when they, they, they released all those dudes, they released all the Taliban guys because Ashraf Ghani said, okay, you promise not to fight them or we'll let you go. Of course you won't. <laughs> and I'm going, you're going to go back to Pakistan, you're going to be straight across the border and shooting the fuck out of the place. And they're going, oh yes, but this is jihad, you're allowed to lie. Whatever. <laughs> well, listen, well, listen, I'm seeing at, at, at the moment they're trying to, at the moment they're negotiating with it's, the US coming out and they're saying, it's going to be on. And, and, the, and the madness is the US are saying, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pull out as long as you agree not to, not to come thing. back fighting. They, they oh, actually, they actually, bluff. they actually don't mind talking to the Americans. It's the fucking government they got a problem with, because they they don't have a say with the government. And even though the Afghan Ash- government, yeah, yeah, even though Ashraf Ghani is a decent guy, and he's on the on the world stage, he's he, he's on par with a lot of a lot of other politicians. He's you know, or, or leaders anyway. But it's the fact that because of Afghanistan, he's got to align himself with all these fucking warlords just to get the smallest thing done you know I mean him and Dostum Dostum was being I, I met Dostum years ago my boss knew him from the fucking and that guy's a, he's fucking certified he is a nutcase so he, he basically he basically bullied his way into back into the government when I was in there and um, you know he goes down, he takes all his own militia, he, he basically fucking disregards the military and all the rest of it. And he's, he's, I don't know, I can't remember his position, what he was, it was some made up position. He goes in this one province they're having, having dramas with, with his militia, and they just go fucking ape shit on any of the Taliban they get, and putting heads on the side, all down the sides of the road and shit, just to, yeah, fuck off. And this is a guy who's, like, can walk into the president's office at any time to get advising on things. This, you know, but it's Afghanistan. That's how it is. I should say it's not just the Americans doing that negotiating. It's fucking the UK as well. It's just, yeah. it's just a just a way to get out and and, and try and, and have some like, yeah, salvage. We've got the salvage agreement. Thing. Yeah, but, but it's, it's going to be the same as the one with the Russians. It's going to be something to be worth it. It's pretty normal. No. They're going to go back to doing what they've always done. Yeah, madness. Well, I mean, there was, I did talk about it in the book. But it's a, it's a story worth mentioning. Even. I knew a heap of Blackwater guys and dudes who were working for TRS and that who were, who were running in the early days um, with the spooks and they were flying in NI-17s just fucking pallets of money okay and, and where did all that go and so it's just bizarre shit but the whole thing with money you can give it give, we had this we went to this um, we're getting this truck company because that was part of the thing it was, it was a bit of a money spinner we, we'd go to various Afghan trucking companies and go listen if, if you want to run shit for the government for the for the Americans these are the guys that are going to be with you to protect you we can protect you and we're going to take 5% you know, you know all the usual bullshit 
So we go to this guy, and he had all, he had a what like, decent truck. So I run it like fucking Mercedes Benzes and shit, and, and they, were, they were you know second hand ones from Germany and shit. So I'm good nick. They went all fucking jingle trucked out and all the rest of it to a degree. Um, and he's he's going on here because the boss was like, "Yeah, this dude's fucking minted apparently." Okay, I'm good cruise around there. I think and he's he's there. He's got his son there with an AK. He's some fucking nephew or cousin or whatever as well. And he's going here, which is a house. The whole house is about as big as this. I keep the lounge room and dining room together. Dirt floor. And he's going here, which is, and he's got this under your cell. I'll show you. I'll show you. He's got underneath a, a rug covered up. He's got one of those shitty ass galvanized trunks. Those big fucking things you see on the side. Remember them? Pack the gun whales, fucking hundred dollar bills. Easy, one point two, one point five in there. <laughs> yeah, what, million or two. <laughs> Ticket over way. So, what's my gun? <laughs> this guy has got this money. He's got his two wives living in, and kid in the next room. His oldest son and that there. Dirt floor. All these trucks. Trucks paid for that. But he understands this. All this cash is is leverage over people. It makes him a powerful man. Not for what it could give him, not what it give his family, but for what it does for him in Afghanistan. And that, that's sort of where I got how how they see wealth in that country. They don't see it in that because you, you know, they, when they get a, a, they buy stupid shit, a big fucking couches that take up the whole. You sort of sitting in them like this, going, "What the fuck?" You know, it, they don't. This guy had enough money to just basically fuck off and do whatever. But he chooses to keep it like that so people know he's a rich man. He can do whatever he wants, but he's going to live like shit. His kid's going to live like shit. His wife's going to live like shit. And I was like, eh, fuck anything. And just a weird... Different weird, values and yeah. different wants, right? I mean, we're going to start... We're going to finish up there a minute, but... But... Well, but, 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 question for you. In your time... Um, I don't know what your opinion was before we went in um, regarding the Afghan campaign or Iraq or the Middle East. Did it, so you, you spent, like you said, a lot of time with Taliban. You spent a, mm. a, a very unique insight into those people. Yeah. Which is, you know, well, it, absolutely unique. Did, what's your opinion of, um, of our, I want to say our, I mean, West intervention, Middle East. Let's talk about Afghan or we can generalize it. What's your, what's, what's your thoughts on it all? Right. I was, I was an instructor at our school in, on September 11, and I watched it. Well, I was actually on leave. I just finished a platoon. I had a couple of days off. Is that Australian yeah. depot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I was going out with a British girl at the time. She was at work, and she rings me up and goes, "Turn the news on." What's on? I'm like, "Holy fuck!" That changes things. And we had a couple of Yanks who were there's always a Ranger um, sergeant post to our school infantry, and there's a few other Yank positions there. So you know they they were all fucking fired up, of course. I went straight to work and I was like, fuck. Um, and over the years, I've lost a lot of mates in Afghanistan particularly. Um, all got because a lot of, one RAR back well, from the 90s was, was a bit like how the Reg is with the, with the two two guys. It's just a, a direct feed, essentially. Um, and it was for, for our guys in Perth. And then the commandos started um, building capability. And when I left, a lot of my soldiers that worked under me in, in reconnaissance were all went to two commander um fighting the taliban it's the wrong move because they're, they're the only the methodology aside they're um they're the only stability in the place everybody fucking says that they're what sorry they're the only stability in the place they're not fighting amongst themselves if they're, they're, they're together they're, they're, look, it goes back to what I was saying about how they were upstairs regimented everyone has a job it's not wallowed over here wallowed over no well I don't like what you're doing fuck that I want to take over your thing and they're just fighting for the sake of fucking fighting because they don't know how to do anything else you know I, it, <sighs> what drives them religion yeah a little bit it's an interesting thing because talking to Hakimi about it with the, um, he's talking about the, I asked him, I asked him about suicide bombers and went on the side. He must have been rubbish at that. 
Well, <laughs> it, it, was, it was interesting. It was interesting about uh, because uh, they, they had one guy. Unless they were, unless they were in training. Well, I, I sort of say, how the fuck do you get people to blow themselves up? What's the go with these? Well, Americans have their drones. This is sort of our thing. And then I saw them. I saw them in there doing it. So they they get all these drug addicts because of the opium. It was part of their fucking campaign. They did part of the thing they did was they used opium and they were and they were getting it out through. They would sell it to the fucking people, very people that fight. Like House of Dean, that warlord who worked for our company, he was buying fucking drugs from the Taliban, was swapping them for weapons. But he's Panchiri and they're all fucking Pashtun. They fucking hate each other. But this is business, so the, the other business can go on, you know. And so the king said, it was interesting because um, they had one guy in there who's actually he's Afghan, but he was a he was a, a doctor. Trained in Pakistan, he's also a psychologist. I mean, he's fucking terrifying, but he was Daesh. He was he was proper fucking AQ. Sorry, not not fucking Daesh. He was Al Qaeda. He was the only one in there who actually fucking scared me a little bit because he was smart. He sent me this letter, and I just like ah, and gave it to the embassy, and they're like, "Holy shit, you're in here with these people." <laughs> and um, I watched this guy get in these fucking some of these kids' heads. So they get these young drug addicts in. And they basically fucking look, we'll get you out, we'll fucking we'll bribe the land, you go out there and, and they fucking keep them on the gear, they give them the vest, and off they go. That's where they get them from. Half of them are fucking drug addicts, yeah. Condition vulnerable. And I'm saying, okay, so what, what happens when the Americans fuck off? What are you going to do with these guys? Oh, we'll take them down to the Olympic Stadium and we're going to kill them anyway. And I said, but when they blow themselves up, do they, are they really going to go, go to Allah? Oh, that's between them and Allah. It's nothing to do with me. Okay. So there's, there's a, it actually makes sense when you look at it from their point of view. It's fucking cold as fuck, it's, it's, but it works. It's, mm. They're going to kill these guys anyway. We'll use them as a weapon. Fuck it. Mm. 90, 95% of suicide bombings in that place, drug addicts. I watched them do it in there. I watched them get in these kids' heads. and Because they're, they're, the, they're on the fucking switch anyway because they're going cold turkey. They're like, oh, oh. No, 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 we'll get you out. We'll sort you out. They'd sort them out with gear in there. They'd get them out. They'd fucking, they'd be looked after for a while. They'd, oh, your family will be looked after. I don't know if that's true or not. They're probably not. Um, here's your vest. Off you go. Yeah. When, uh, I remember when I was <coughs> out there the first time and it was, they would, they would, they would, um, they used on occasion, um, disabled kids. Yeah. Because family, it's like, it's culture out there. Family don't, Mally them, yeah. yeah. See you later, and that's and, and gone. You know, unfortunate. But I mean, no, we got to start that with like, like, yeah. twenty in there. Right, you did the book, yes, called Seventh Circle. The Seventh Circle, and it's published by Alan and Unwin, and it's um, out in Australia and the UK through that publisher. But it's on. I've seen it on Amazon. It's yeah, a search you can get it pretty much. But yeah, it's, it's on its third printing or something now. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. That's a good thing. Um. Mate, thank you for talking to me. That's I right. do appreciate it. It's, it's and uh, and it appears as though you're well for yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> no, sort of, which is good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm alive. That's all that matters. I sort of miss it sometimes, but you know, it's sort of better than sitting around over there. Mm. Um, anything you want to shameless plug? Anything you want to mention before we shut off? No, I'm good, mate. No, I don't think so. No, 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 no,